All righty then. Okay. Okay. What's happening? Okay, fellas, how you doing? Let's see if it works. What's up, Q to the one, to the one? Yeah. There's a couple second delay. But you see my shirt? I got Superman on. Calvin is staring. How are you, brother? Let's see. Can you see the Superman? Orbiter, how are you? We're going to wait a few more minutes. There goes Superman. 1611, what's up, brother? Okay, I got my Superman shirt. How are you, everyone? Halal Hogan has arrived. Yeah, just let's wait a few more minutes and for a few more faces to show up. This is impromptu. I was supposed to do a live stream yesterday, but unfortunately, YouTube was acting up. So if you guys were waiting, it wasn't my fault. <clears throat> Ron, Ron Bowes, Raiders money. Okay, can, I can answer that easily, but which passage of scripture did they point to? Hopefully, our dear friend, Protestant believer will show up under a nick and or first and the last. First and last will show up so it can post verses. If not, I'll do it. So I'm gonna have to do both. <clears throat> I'm just waiting for a few more faces to show up before we officially begin. I was trying to get on yesterday. What happened was, <clears throat> I'm actually in Wisconsin, in a small town in Wisconsin where the internet connection is not the best, but what made it worse is that YouTube, YouTube actually wasn't working. For some reason, <clears throat> the live stream for YouTube was down, so I couldn't come on. So, but Orbiter said he'll post verses. Okay, my brother, thank you. Praise the Lord Jesus. So we'll assign you the task of posting verses if that's okay, All right? Anyway, just let's wait a few more minutes, my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. I pray the Spirit will fill me for the glory of Jesus Christ. And more importantly, I pray the Holy Spirit will give us the power, especially me, because I need it, <clears throat> to live holy unto Jesus Christ, to be passionate in love with Jesus Christ, to be sold out for Jesus Christ, to love Jesus Christ more than anything, more than our own lives, and be willing to die for Jesus Christ, and to be pure for Jesus Christ, and, and serve others from a pure motive, sanctified by the Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ, because we love Jesus Christ, we love the Son of God, we love the Father's beloved, we love the Father's heart, the virgin-born Son of Mary. <clears throat> We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We worship you. We love you. We adore you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, bless our family members. Bless us. Bless my precious daughters. <clears throat> Watch over them. Watch over every one of us. Cover us with the blood of Jesus Christ. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Fill us with life from the Holy Spirit. Power from the Holy Spirit. Wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Knowledge from the Holy Spirit. Boldness from the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And crucify our flesh. Destroy our flesh. Destroy the fruit of our flesh. Please, Father, help us and sanctify me, Father, in the blood of Jesus and fill me with the Spirit to bless your people, Father. Destroy all distractions of the enemy. Keep me focused, Father. <clears throat> fill my lungs and my chest and my throat with the breath of life and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants and enable me to recall Scripture, interpret it correctly, and then live it out by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that for all of us because we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. You know, I had a brother in Christ that I don't like too much. He doesn't like me. We, we hate to love each other. That was actually mocking me because of my prayers. He was saying, yeah, it's like I, I assume that they're like magical incantations. That just tells you his evil heart. May God have mercy on him. He knows who he is. I won't mention him. But good to see every one of you. L MLP Shady, in regards to Tom, bless the Lord's best man, is, is it wise to not read too much of the parable? L MLP, why would you ask me that question? Are you already assuming to know how I'm going to interpret the scriptures or the parable specifically so that you had to chime in? Uh, MLP. One thing about our Lord Jesus Christ, he is pleased in his infinite wisdom to use imperfect vessels to preach his perfect word, vessels that have 
serious issues and flaws, who by the power of the Holy Spirit are being sanctified to become more like him. Now, MLP, I don't know why this brother or sister would even ask the question. No, it's not the topic. God have mercy. I have many imperfections. You guys know that. I'm an open book. I have many imperfections. Impatience, anger, pride. May God save me from that for the glory of Jesus Christ. MLP, if you don't like the fact that I'm going to use the parables to prove the deity of Christ, maybe you can leave. What do you think? Right? Remember, not every teacher is going to reach every person. That's why God, in his wisdom, raise, raises up different teachers with different temperaments to reach different groups because some individuals will like one teacher more than someone else. Right? But why, do you, why, why don't you do yourself a favor on MLP and maybe just go to another channel? I don't think this is going to be for you. Right? Yeah, and MLP, why don't you? Yeah, please, do, do us a favor. Why don't you just, you know? Don't be used of the devil to cause distractions, please. Just do us over us. God bless you. Love you for the sake of the Lord. How are you, Sister Tatiana? God bless you too. We'll begin in a few minutes. You see, we haven't even begun the discussion and we have a nuisance to try to distract, right? Bashar, do you want to leave too? Bashar, hold on. Let me send you that. Yeah, let me make it easy for you guys. Hold on. Hold on. Let me make it easy for you guys. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm not politically correct, and I'm not going to appeal to everyone. May God have mercy on us. In Jesus' name. All right. Okay, guys. Sorry for the distractions. Satan will always try to divide brothers. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ to cover us and the Holy Spirit to seal us. But please don't distract me and help me to help you. Please help me to help you. Don't bring up irrelevant issues or say things that's going to distract me from blessing you and grieving the Spirit because I don't want to, right? All right. Okay, folks, we're going to begin in a few minutes because I want to make some announcements and then we're going to go into specific parables to show that in those parables, Jesus Christ affirms his divine identity, that he is the divine son of God, the unique son of God, who's essentially one with the father. He is not the father. He's personally distinct from the father, but one with him in essence, nature and glory and honor. Right. And for the rest of you, forgive me for having to do what I do. I don't want to be unnecessarily offensive, but you do have people who think they know it all. One thing I've noticed in Christianity, we have too many chiefs, not enough Indians, people who think they're qualified to interpret scripture, right? My qualification comes from God. I don't think I'm qualified. It's the Holy Spirit that qualifies me and David Wood and others to do this work for the glory of Jesus. Our sufficiency is from the Lord, right? And may the Lord beatify us with his holiness <clears throat> for his glory in Jesus' name. Okay, don't worry, Rambos. I'll get into it. Now, if, if you guys are ready, I'll begin. Let me know. Just put a one or, or say yes if you're ready. We can begin. Sorry for distractions. Sorry for distractions. <clears throat> okay. All right. Now, with that said, just to let you know, I'm actually in a small town somewhere in Wisconsin, right? <clears throat> I don't want to give the name of the town because I'm actually here to support our dear brother in Jesus Christ, Usama Dakdok. Usama Dakdok is a fiery, spirit-filled Egyptian Christian, right? Right? <clears throat> yes, do that, please. Don't do me a favor, MLP. Stop supporting me on Patreon and don't show up to my channels. Don't engage me anymore. Bye-bye. You see that? You see the threat? Oh, I'm going to stop supporting you, Patreon. Thank you, MLP. I'm going to lose sleep now. But thank you for exposing your motives and why you do what you do. God have mercy on you. Coming back to the issue, Usama Dakdok is a spirit-filled, fiery Egyptian preacher who loves Jesus Christ. Right? So he's been invited to a local church to talk about the threat of Islam, and I decided to come up and join him for support. Not that he needs me. I just came because, you know, I decided instead of saying in Chicago, just come up here. He's going to be here till Wednesday speaking. So pray for him. Pray the Lord Jesus blesses him, his wife, his ministry. Pray for his son, Caleb. The Lord will touch his heart. Pray for his financial support because this man <clears throat> does it sacrificially. He's truly a man of integrity, and he does it for the glory of Christ. He doesn't do it for money. 
So ask the Lord to richly bless him and provide for all his needs and to watch over his family and to use him mightily in this small town. In fact, just to let you know, though this town is small, the Muslims have already infiltrated. There was a Pakistani Muslim lady that actually spoke about Islam in their local library. So the Muslims are here and they're trying to <clears throat> indoctrinate the locals about how peaceful and beautiful Islam is. So we need the Christians here to know the true face of Islam and to be ready to reach Muslims with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, he does. Usama Dakdok, I think it's called Usama Way. But he also has a website called The Straight Way. I think it's The Straight Way Ministries. Just put U-S-A-M-A, -A, Usama, Dakdok, D-A-K-D-O-K, -K, Orbiter already posted his name. He's a man worth your <coughs> financial support. Support him. Thank you, straightway.org. Support him financially and prayerfully. Learn from him and encourage him for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. I need it. Latin, Capone, may the blood of Jesus cover me. Give me the power to crucify my flesh. Be more patient and cover every one of you for the glory of Jesus Christ. Right? Okay, so that's where I'm at. That's what I'm doing here till Wednesday. So because I have some free time, because he doesn't teach till the evening, I decided I'll do some live streams if God, God wills. Yeah, obviously, yesterday didn't happen. And I also want to thank, and ironically, I just lost one patient supporter. God bless that person. <clears throat> I also want to thank, thank all the brothers and sisters who've been supporting my ministry financially via Patreon or even PayPal. There are many of you that I want to actually personally thank, but I've been extremely busy with issues, not just ministry, not just writing for the blog, not just doing, let's say, live streams on my own or with Al Fadi or David Wood. But there are some issues concerning my own personal life that the Lord Jesus Christ is seeing me through and delivering me from. Issues related to my two angels, my precious daughters, my nine-year-old and six-year-old. And God is doing some miraculous things, fighting for us to protect us and keep us together by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the blood of Jesus. So please pray for me. I sense something miraculous is happening to set me free from these setbacks of the evil one, of Satan, who's trying to distract me from devoting myself entirely to glorifying Christ in ministry and raising my daughter. So pray for the victory, pray for the manifestation of the miracle, and also pray that the Lord Jesus will confirm <clears throat> my move to Arizona. I'm planning to leave Chicago and relocate in Arizona. Pray if it's God's will, he'll confirm it. So I'll be there by the end of the summer and that the Lord will sustain me there, provide for me and through me so that I can start a new chapter in my life with my daughters that by the grace of Jesus, they will join me sooner than later. So pray for that. And again, I want to just thank all of you patron supporters and those of you who support me via PayPal. God bless you. I truly appreciate your support. The Lord Jesus richly bless you. And the Lord Jesus sustain you and fill you with his love, his presence, his peace and his Holy Spirit. So again, I want to thank every one of you. In time, I will try to personally reach out via email and thank you personally, but please bear with me, right? <clears throat> like I said, I'm almost out of the wilderness. I'm still in the wilderness, but I'm coming out mightily by the gracious arm of our Chinese God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. So thank you again, and I love you guys for the sake of Jesus. And do pray for me. Look, I'm the farthest thing from perfection. I know I have issues, but I don't know of any Christian apologist who doesn't have issues. Every Christian apologist has something, some issues he struggles with, something of the flesh. No excuse, but it's just reality. We are imperfect vessels. Ask Jesus to help me to be more patient, less angry, more loving, more tolerant, especially towards my brothers and sisters in Christ, so that I can walk more worthily of Jesus Christ and be more like him. You guys know my issues. You've been with me. Short fused, impatient, right? And ask the Lord just to transform me so I don't be an unnecessary stumbling block to brothers and sisters in Christ who mean well, but sometimes say things they should. Same with me. So I appreciate your prayers and I do love you for the sake of Jesus. And you don't need to be here listening to me. God doesn't need me. God doesn't need David Wood. God doesn't need Usama Dakdok. He doesn't need any of us. We need him and it's an honor and a privilege that God would even use us in the power of the Spirit to glorify Jesus Christ. So it's an honor and a privilege. 
So keep praying for us, all right? Pray can be more like Jesus Christ. And pray that God will show me the path. Because like, let me be honest, folks. It's hard to be alone, but I know the Lord has someone for me. And I'm just waiting for confirmation. So pray for that confirmation. So with that said, in Jesus' name, are we ready to begin? Well, even if I knew what country Christian Prince is from, are you saying originally where he's from? I thought you said where he's, where he's living now. Even if I knew where Christian Prince was living now, I wouldn't reveal that, right? I wouldn't reveal that for his safety, right? But I don't know where he's originally from. That I don't know. But may the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be blessed with this session. May he use it as it's archived on my YouTube page to reach many more people and touch the hearts of many more people for the glory of Jesus Christ. I was going to look at some of the parables, Boaz, to show that in the parables, Jesus Christ actually affirms his divine identity. In the parables, Jesus actually claims to be the divine, unique Son of God. The Son of God who is essentially one with the Father. One with the Father, in essence, glory, power, and majesty. He's not the same person as the Father, but he shares the deity of the Father. He possesses the deity of the Father to the same extent that the Father does, because they're one God. Distinct persons, an intimate love, communion, fellowship, yet one God. So that's what I want to do. Sa'an Noam, good to see you. So let's look at some of the parables and thank our brother Orbiter, because again, Orbiter, you're not a Protestant believer, are you? Under a different nick? I try to find Protestant believer in my settings and I couldn't, because I know Protestant believer has different names. So let's just check. Oh yeah, okay, hey, good, he's here. All right, man, God bless you. I'm trying to find your other nick, man. And by the way, subscribe to Orbiter High's YouTube page, Protestant Believer. Subscribe to it. And also subscribe to my page and hit the like button for the glory of Jesus. I'll explain what the Son of Man means in a minute. But let's look at some of the passages where Christ affirms his divine identity. Let's look at the parable found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30. Let's first read the parable. My emphasis on the parables is to show how Jesus identifies himself as God in the flesh, the unique divine son of God, who's one with the father. And in breaking down this parable, he does refer to himself as a son of man. So I'll explain what it means for him to be the son of man. So Boaz, Lord Jesus willing, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. Okay, Mark, I'm sorry, Matthew 13, 24 to 30. And thank our brother Orbiter for posting verses. Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Let's read folks. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, pay attention, pay attention. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man. I want you to remember that <clears throat> statement, likened unto a man, which sowed good seed in his field. So folks, underline a man and his field. This man sowed seed in his field. The field belongs to this man. Folks, don't forget that. A man and his field, and he sowed good seed. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was flung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. He said unto them, An enemy had done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? So the servants of the man who owns the field, right, come to him saying, Should we gather the tares? <clears throat> but he said, Nay. <clears throat> Lest while ye gather up the tares, ye read up also the wheat with them. Because in the beginning stages, this particular tear looks identical to wheat. It's only when harvest season comes that you can distinguish the two. So he goes, no, wait for the harvest. Watch. Let both grow together unto the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn. Now, guys, pay attention. A man owns a field. And he has servants, and he, pl he plants good seed in his field, wheat. His enemy comes and plants tares in his field. <clears throat> the owner of the field, the man says, do not pluck the tares, lest by accident you also pluck the wheat. Wait for harvest season when they're fully blossomed, fully bloomed, and you can tell the difference between the wheat and the tare. Then gather the tares and throw them in the fire, and then gather the wheat and put it in the barn, right? The man owns the field. 
the man owns the field. The reapers will gather the tares at harvest time. Is that clear before I move on? Because you're going to see who Jesus claims to be here. You guys get it so far? Before I move on. <clears throat> okay. 1611 gets it. Did everyone understand the parable thus far? Okay, good. If you get confused, put a two or say no so I can clarify. Now let's see Jesus' explanation. Let's see our Lord's explanation of the parable. Matthew 13, 36 to 43. Matthew 13, 36 to 43. Now he's going to explain it. And I'll tell you what the point of the parable is. Matthew 13, 36 to 43. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Now watch here. Watch here. Matthew 13, 37 to 38. And stop. Orbiter, after you put 38, stop. Matthew 13, 37, 38. Okay, stop. Read with me. He answered and said unto, unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. Right there. The man who sowed the good seed in his field is the son of man, Jesus. And the field is the world. Right there, Jesus claims to be the man who owns the field and claims the field is the world. Did you catch Jesus' implication? He is the owner of the world. He owns the world and everything in it. He is the man who owns the field. The field is the world, and the man is Jesus, the Son of Man. Therefore, Jesus Christ owns the world and everything in it. Did you, claim, did you understand that? Before we move on? Do you see that? Before we move on. Just want to make sure. Let's see how many of you are getting it. Sorry for the delay, folks, but I just got to make sure this is a teaching session, so I have to wait. Okay. So here our Lord claims to be the owner of the, the entire earth, the one who owns the world and everything in it. He even owns believers because notice 38 again. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. So the good seed are believers that Jesus has planted to be part of his kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked. So Jesus Christ owns the world and owns believers and owns the kingdom. Who does Jesus think he is? Let's continue reading. Okay, let's continue reading. 39 to 43. Watch here. The enemy that sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. So the harvest is the end of the age where Christ comes to judge the living and the dead, the righteous and the wicked. Okay, The reapers will then gather the tares, meaning the sons of the devil are angels. Now let's keep reading. Therefore, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. Wow, did you catch it? Not only does the Son of Man own the world, own believers, he owns the angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom, and he owns the kingdom, all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who, who, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So now let's break it down. Jesus Christ is the son of man who owns the world, owns believers, Owns the kingdom of heaven and owns the angels. They all belong to him. The kingdom of the Son of Man also belongs to the kingdom of the Father. And this kingdom of the Father and the Son, they share with believers. But did you catch it? The Son of Man and the Father own the kingdom. The Son of Man owns the world and everything in it. The Son of Man owns the good seed, the believers. And the Son of Man owns the angels. They are his angels who obey him, his servants. Do you see how much meat in this one parable that points to the deity of Christ, that he's the divine son of God, who is one with the Father, greater than all creation, Lord over all creatures. 
You catch it? But let's go to Psalm 24, verse 1. Psalm 24, verse 1. Who owns the world and everything in it? Who owns the world and everything in it? Let me know if you're catching this, folks, and if it's blessing you. Okay. The earth is the Lord's, Yahovah, Jehovah's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Wait. The entire world and everything in it belongs to Jehovah. The entire world, everything in it, the kingdom, believers, and angels belong to Jesus, the Son of Man. You guys catching it? Who would have thunk it? Who would have thought that this parable would point to Jesus claiming to be God in the flesh, distinct from the Father, yet one with him and greater than all creatures? Now, let me know if you're getting it. If you're not, put it too. I want to make sure you're getting it so we can go to the next point. I'm going to break down the Son of Man. Why did Jesus Christ, our Lord, refer to himself as the Son of Man? Okay. Let me make sure you get it. Put a one if you're getting it. Put a two if you're not. If you need clarification. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Clorox, so can we? Arbiter, you're an admin, right? Hold on. Get rid of these nuisances. Clorox Beach is being a nuisance. All right. Okay, for those of you who are serious and not agents of Satan, right, we're going to focus. Okay. Now, why does Jesus Christ, our Lord, call himself the Son of Man? Well, one reason is because to be the Son of Man, a Son of Man means you're human. You're truly human. Yes, Starblaze, the reason why I couldn't get on YouTube because the live stream from YouTube was down. It wasn't working. So that wasn't my fault. That's why I'm doing it today. So my apologies. Yes, but let me explain why Jesus calls himself Son of Man. Son of Man is an Aramaic expression meaning a man, a human being. Son of Man means a human being, someone who's human, someone who is man by nature. So Jesus Christ calls himself Son of Man because he's truly human. He's a man by nature. But he also calls himself Son of Man for another reason. He also calls himself the Son of Man for another reason. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. So the first reason why Jesus Christ calls himself the Son of Man, because he's truly human, he's a man by nature. So Son of Man refers to his humanity, that he's truly human and identifies with the human race because he's part of us, he became one of us, right? That's okay, you can go to CP, God bless you. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Now notice, Daniel the prophet, over 600 years before the birth of Christ, sees someone who looks like a human being, a Son of Man, and he's riding the clouds of heaven, and he comes to the Ancient of Days. Now let's read what he says about the Son of Man. And there was given him dominion. This Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days and was given him dominion the power to rule, and glory, and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Did you catch it? Daniel sees a human figure who's more than human, a human figure, a son of man with, coming on the clouds. This human figure approaches the Ancient of Days, which in the New Testament would be God the Father. And when he approaches God the Father, he's given a kingdom that's indestructible. He's an eternal king who rules forever over an indestructible kingdom. And all nations and languages and peoples must worship, serve him. Did you catch it? Do you see what Daniel saw by the power of the Holy Spirit? A son of man, a human figure who rides the clouds who rules forever, whose kingdom is indestructible, and whom all nations must worship and serve. In other words, this son of man, this son of man is not an ordinary human being. Though human, he's more than human, he's fully divine. He's God in human appearance, God in human form, God in human flesh. How do I know he's God in human flesh? Because all nations worship him the way they worship God. He rides the clouds, which is something only God does, and he rules forever over all nations. Did you catch it? And I'm going to prove to you. This Son of Man is God in human form, distinct from the Ancient of Days, so that's two divine persons. The Ancient of Days was God the Father, 
the Son of Man who is also God, one with the Father, but personally distinct. How do I know the Son of Man is not just human, but more than human? Okay, let's read Daniel 7, 14 one more time. And I'm going to show you this is who Jesus claims to be. Let me know if you're following me. And I'm not confusing you. Yes, Solomon, persuade. Praise God, you got it, Solomon. Jesus claims to be the Son of Man that Daniel saw, not just an ordinary Son of Man. That Son of Man that Daniel saw, that's God in the flesh. That's who Jesus claimed to be. Now let me prove to you this Son of Man, this Son of Man, and only this Son of Man is God in the flesh. And there was given him dominion, glory, and kingdom, that all people, nations, language should serve him, the Aramaic verb pilach, which is worship given to God alone. His dominion is the everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, which shall not be destroyed. So he is served, pilach, Aramaic, because this portion is in Aramaic. Worship by all peoples and nations forever, and he reigns forever. Let's go to Daniel 7, 27. That same verb, serve, is used for the most high. Daniel 7, 27. Daniel 7, 27. No, he's not Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a picture of Jesus. But anyway, Daniel 7, 27, let's read. This son of man who rides the clouds is served, worshiped by all nations forever, as he reigns over all nations forever. Guys, read Daniel 7, 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, meaning us believers, whose kingdom and his everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Did you catch it? The Most High is God Almighty. All dominions shall serve and obey the Most High. All dominions shall worship the Most High. It's the same verb. So let me ask you guys a question. How can the Son of Man be served, worshipped by all nations in the same way that all dominions serve, worship the Most High if the Son of Man is not God? Because it's the same verb. All dominions will serve the Most High. All nations will serve the Son of Man forever. How can the Son of Man be served by all nations forever in the same way that the Most High is served when that kind of service can only be given to God? What does this tell us about the Son of Man? What does it tell us about the Son of Man? You can stop restricting Clark, Clark's bleaches comments. If he says something silly, then we can block him. Okay, now block him. He's, he's an idiot. He's a son of Satan. So if the Son of Man will, is receiving the same service by all nations forever that the Most High receives, and only the Most High can be served in that manner, not a creature, because that would be idolatry. What does this tell us about the Son of Man? What does this tell us about the Son of Man? What is the implication? Let me see if you guys are getting it. How can the Son of Man be given the same service that the Most High receives from all nations forever? Come on, guys. Let's see how many of you get it. You got it, Boaz. Descent and test the spirits. The Son of Man is not a creature. He's God in human form, in human appearance, in human flesh. You got it. The second line of evidence proving the Son of Man is God. Let's go to Daniel 7, 13. You got it, 16, 11. Daniel 7, 13. And then I'm going to show you that Jesus claims to be that Son of Man. God bless you too, Alex. Jesus claims to be that Son of Man. Okay. Okay. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven. Pay attention. The Son of Man rides the clouds of heaven. Clouds of heaven. No one but God Almighty in the Old Testament rides the clouds of heaven. Did you know that? Even in the ancient Near Eastern peoples, the pagan nations surrounding Israel, they too believed and affirmed that only gods ride clouds. In other words, in the ancient Near Eastern civilization, the pagan nations surrounding Israel, they too viewed riding the clouds as a divine function. 
something that only divine beings did. According to the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, Jehovah and Jehovah alone rides the clouds of heaven. But catch Daniel 7.13, folks. Daniel 7.13. It says, it says that the Son of Man rides the clouds of heaven. Now let me prove to you the riding of the clouds of heaven is a divine function that the Old Testament says only God does. Are you ready? Are you ready for that proof? The second line of evidence? The Son of Man rides on the clouds of heaven with the clouds of heaven. Therefore, he must be God because that's something only God does. Are you ready for the evidence? Nahum, the book of Nahum. Nahum chapter 1 verse 3. The book of Nahum. Nahum chapter 1 verse 3. Exactly, Boaz. That's exactly why they tore there, because they knew who he was claiming to be, God of the flesh. And now watch here. Read Nahum chapter 1 verse 3 for me. He's going to post it. Thank our brother over to Lord bless you, brother. Okay. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Jehovah rides the clouds. The clouds are the dust of his feet. Did you guys catch it? Jehovah rides the clouds. The clouds are the dust of his feet. Now let's go to Isaiah 19 verse 1. Isaiah 19 verse 1. Watch here. Isaiah 19, verse 1. Now watch here. Who rides the cloud? Who comes on a cloud? Who descends in a cloud? Isaiah 19, verse 1. The burden of Egypt. Behold, Jehovah Lord rideth upon a swift cloud. Jehovah rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. And the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence. And the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. Now let's go to Psalm 104.3. Psalm 104.3. That's Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1, Rambos. Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1. And earlier we quoted Nahum. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 3. Now we're going to Psalm 104, verse 3. I hope this is blessing you folks. Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, Jehovah makes the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. So the clouds are the chariot of Jehovah. Jehovah comes in a swift cloud. The clouds are the dust of Jehovah's feet. Psalm 68, verse 4. Psalm 68, verse 4. Sorry, folks, for my beard. I can't wait to trim it. I hate when it's too thick. But don't hate me because I'm handsome. Psalm 68, verse 4. Sing unto God, sing praises to his name. Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Jah, and rejoice before him. He rides the heavens. He rides the clouds. The clouds are the dust of his feet. He comes in a cloud. You guys catch it? I think I've given you enough proof that... God and God alone, Jehovah rides the clouds of heaven and not a creature. So now let me ask you a question. How can the Son of Man ride the clouds of heaven, which is a divine function? Even the pagans knew this, right? If he's not God. How can the Son of Man be served with the same type of service given to the Most High by all nations forever if he's not God? What does this tell us about the Son of Man in Daniel? This figure that Daniel saw, who is he? He's not a creature. He's God of the flesh, isn't he? Could Daniel be any clearer in indicating that this Son of Man is more than human? He's God of the flesh and human appearance. And yet at the same time, Daniel saw another divine figure, the Ancient of Days. Ancient of Days and the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days. So Daniel, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, saw two divine persons. The Ancient of Days, whom the New Testament says is God the Father, and the Son of Man, whom the New Testament identifies as Jesus Christ. Is that clear? 
So why did Jesus Christ claim to be the Son of Man? To show that he's truly human, he's one of us, became part of us, but he's also God in human flesh, the one that Daniel saw. Now let's prove it, that Jesus is claiming to be the Son of Man that Daniel saw. Mark 14, 61 and 62. Mark 14, 61 and 62. Fourteen, sixty-one, and sixty-two. Let's see who Jesus claims to be. Watch here. But he held his peace and answered not, nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, "Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed?" Now notice who Jesus claims to be. And Jesus said, "I am." And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Bam. Did you catch it? Jesus says, I am the Christ, the Son of God, and you will see the Son of Man, me, me, the Son of Man, sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus just took Daniel 7, 13 and 14 and applied it to himself. He just identified himself as the Son of Man that Daniel saw. Did you catch it? Now let's go to Matthew 25, 31 to 34. Matthew 25, 31 to 34. Let's see who Jesus claimed to be. Matthew 25, 31 to 34. It's going to get more amazing. Just be, bear with me. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Pay attention. Jesus is speaking. Jesus is speaking here. Notice who he claims to be. When the Son of Man come in his glory. Remember the Son of Man Daniel was given glory. And all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Did you catch it? Jesus claims to be the Son of Man who comes in glory with the angels. And has a glorious throne that he sits upon. And before him the Son of Man shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats and he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats <clears throat> you skip the part on the left you skip the part but it's okay verse 33 he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left now watch what jesus says then shall the king say unto them on his right hand come ye blessed of my father did you catch it jesus just said he's the son of man who sits on a throne of glory a glorious throne when he comes with the angels to gather all the nations before him and he will judge all the nations and then he claims that he is the king who will say to the righteous on his right <clears throat> enter into the kingdom you blessed of my father so did you catch it jesus is the son of man god is his father he is the king who sits on a throne of glory who comes with his angels and all the nations will be gathered before him as he determines where they will spend the rest of eternity. You see who Jesus claimed to be? The Son of Man who comes in his glory with the holy angels, who sits on a throne of glory, who gathers all the nations before him, separates the righteous from the wicked, places the righteous on the right, the wicked on the left, and then calls himself the king who will tell the righteous, Receive the kingdom, you blessed of my father. So he is the son of God, who is the son of man. My father, God is my father, meaning he's the son of God, who is the son of man, who sits on a throne of glory, who comes in glory with his angels to judge all nations. Could Jesus be any clearer as to who he is? That son of man that Daniel saw. Right? And how does he end this parable? Let's look at Matthew 26, verses 1 to 2. And then they call him Lord in the parable. Matthew 26, verse 1 to 2. Matthew 26, verses 1 to 2. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these things saying, he said unto his disciples, we know that after two days of the Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed and to be crucified. Did you catch it? 
Notice who he is. He's the son of man who will be crucified. And yet he's also the son of man who will come in his glory with the holy angels to sit on his glorious throne, throne of glory, to gather all the nations, separating the righteous from the wicked, the righteous on his right, the wicked on his left, who calls himself the king and calls God my father. So Jesus is the son of man who's the son of God and the son of man who will be crucified and killed, buried, raised on the third day. That son of man who will come with his angels to sit on his throne of glory, manifest his glory to the nations, who is the king of the nations who determines their eternal destiny. Is it clear? Jesus died as the God-man, the one person who got, died as God in the flesh. But I'll come back to that in a minute. Is that clear? That Jesus is the son of man of Daniel, but he's also the son of man who will be killed. So it's not two different sons of men. It's one son of man. Jesus is that son of man who will be crucified, killed, buried, raised to life. And that same son of man who comes in his glory with his holy angels to sit on his glorious throne to determine the destiny of everyone. Luke 17, 24 to 25. Luke 17, 24 to 25. This took a little longer than I thought, but that's okay. I hope it's still blessing you and you're learning and benefiting from it. Luke 17, 24 to 25. Jesus again speaking. Who does Jesus claim to be? Luke 17, 24 to 25. Okay, Jesus speaking, notice what Jesus says. For as the lightning that lighteth, lighteneth out of the one part under heaven, shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. So he's talking about his coming. It will be so clear when the Son of Man comes, when I, the Son of Man, come in my day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this gener generation. Did you catch it? Who's the Son of Man? The one who will come manifesting his presence so that the whole world will see it will be apparent to everyone like lightning is apparent but first this son of man must be rejected so do you see how jesus christ our lord claims to be that son of man of daniel who comes in glory on the clouds of heaven and whom all nations are subject to and he's the king of all nations who determines where they will live forever and whom all nations must serve and worship the way they worship god that he's that son of man because that's the same son of man who is rejected by that generation. That same son of man who will be killed by that generation. That same son of man who will be crucified by that generation. Buried and then come to life. Do you see it? Is that clear? Now let's go to Matthew 16, 21. And then 27. Matthew 16, 21 and 27. Watch here. Lord bless you. Miss SVP1. Amen, amen, amen in Jesus' name. For my children and I. Okay. Okay, now. Matthew 16, 21 and 27. Watch what happens here. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. So he's going to explain that he's going to be killed. Peter gets scandalized by it. But now notice 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. Did you catch it? Who is the Son of Man? He's the Son of God. Because the Son of Man comes in the glory of his Father. So God is the father of the son of man. The son of man is the son of God the father. So when he says the son of man shall come in the glory of his father, Jesus is saying, I'm that son of man. I'm the son of man who comes in the glory of my father. So the son of man is the son of God with his angels. Wow. Jesus is not just the son of man and God is not just his father, but the angels belong to him. For the son of man shall come in the glory of his father with his angels and then he, the Son of Man, who is the Son of God, shall reward every man according to his works. Did you catch it? 
So who's the son of man who's going to come in the glory of God the Father? To judge every man and repay every man for what he or she has done? Who's that son of man? The son of God. And who's the son of God? Jesus Christ. So you see why now Jesus claimed to be the son of man? Because he's truly human, because to be a son of man means you're human. But he's also identifying himself as that son of man that the prophet Daniel saw by the spirit. That son of man who's God in human form, God in flesh. That son of man who comes with the clouds of heaven, who rules all nations forever because he's an eternal king. And whom all nations are subject to and must serve and worship the way they worship God. That's who Jesus claims to be. Gerson, please don't comment. Jesus, the God-man, died. As God, he died in the flesh. The God-man died because death doesn't mean that Jesus ceased to exist. So don't fall for the trap saying, oh, the man part died. No, the God-man, that one person who is God and man, God in the flesh died. God died a human death without ceasing to exist. Anyway, just let's focus on this. Everyone with me so far? Now let me put the icing on the cake. Let's read Matthew 16, 27 and Isaiah 40, verse 10, back to back. I want to see if you catch who Jesus claims to be. Matthew 16, 27 and Isaiah 40, verse 10, back to back. So Gerson, don't fall for the trap of the Jehovah's Witnesses Muslims say, oh, the man part died, because they're setting you up. Just say the God-man died. That one person who's truly God, truly human, two natures, one person, the God-man died. God the Son experienced human death without ceasing to exist, because they're defining death to mean ceasing to exist. Who told you that's the definition of death? When you die, you don't cease to exist. Humans, when they physically die, their spirits leave their bodies, and they continue to exist consciously as disembodied spirits, spirits without bodies, but they're still consciously alive. But anyway, Matthew 16, 27, Isaiah 40, verse 10. Let's read it, folks. Everyone read it. For the Son of Man, that's Jesus, shall come in the glory of his Father, so God the Father. God is the Father of the Son of Man, showing it's Jesus, the Son of God, with his angels. Now notice what Jesus says he'll do when he comes. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. So Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God, comes with the angels, his angels, to reward, repay every man according to his works. Now read that in light of Isaiah 40, verse 10. Behold, the Lord God, the Lord Jehovah, will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for, for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. Did you catch it? Isaiah 40, verse 10 says, Jehovah God is coming to reward and repay people. But Jesus said in Matthew 16, 27, I am the son of man who is the son of God who comes with my angels to reward and repay everyone according to what he or she has done. Why is Jesus ascribing what Isaiah attributed to Jehovah and applying it to himself? Isaiah said Jehovah is coming to reward people. Jesus says I am the one coming to reward people. Why did Jesus take what Isaiah said about Jehovah and apply it to himself, the son of God? Why do you do that? Why did he do that? Can you explain to me why Jesus would take what Isaiah said about Jehovah? Jehovah's coming to reward people and say, I'm the one who's the son of man. God is my father, and I'm coming with my angels to reward people. You got it. Descent, test, and Boaz, because he is God. He is of the father, Yah, and he shares the essence of Yah, his father. And Boaz said it. He's God. You got it. So do you see why Jesus Christ claimed to be the son of man? God bless you too, born again. Thank you, Solomon, Persiah. You got it. Jesus is claiming to be the God of Isaiah, the God that Isaiah saw. Gerson, you got it. God bless you guys. And praise the Holy Spirit and thank the Holy Spirit for enabling you to understand.
Amazing, right? So the Son of Man does refer to the fact that Jesus is truly human, but it also identifies himself as the God-Man. God who became flesh, the God-Man that Daniel saw. It's one of the most powerful testimonies to his deity, that he's God in the flesh. You see that? Did I make my case clear? If that's clear why Jesus claimed to be the Son of Man, I cannot go on to the other parable. If you're ready. Okay. Before I go to the other parable, let's look at another portion of Scripture from Matthew. Matthew 12, 6 to 8. Let's break this down. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. And then we'll go into the parable. And Lord willing, if you guys want, I can come back tomorrow around the same time, God willing, and do another session. <clears throat> Thank you, strong one. Can you pray that the Spirit continues to fill me for the glory of Jesus, the Son of God? Amen. Matthew 12, 6 to 8. Let's read, folks. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Let's read it one more time. This time, Orbiter, just post, post Matthew 12, verse 6, and skip 7. Matthew 12, 6, and 8. Guys, watch this. Who, notice who Jesus Christ our Lord claims to be. Watch here. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Did you catch what Jesus just claimed? He claims to be greater than the temple. Greater than the temple. And he claims to be the Son of Man who's Lord even of the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day belongs to him. He owns it. He's Lord over it. And he determines what is and what isn't work on the Sabbath day. Did you guys catch it? Jesus, the Son of Man, is greater than the temple, and he owns the Sabbath day. He is Lord over it. So he tells you what you can and cannot do. Put it one if you caught that part, because I'm going to unpack the meat of it. Did you understand who he just claimed to be? He claims to be greater than the temple in Jerusalem, the temple of God, and the Lord of the Sabbath, who owns the Sabbath. So he tells you what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath. Put a one if you got it. Put one if you got it. Okay, now let me tell you why that's amazing. Let's go to Matthew 23, 21 and see what Jesus says about the temple. Matthew 23, 21. Let us see what he says about the temple. Watch here. Watch how mind-blowing that statement is. Jesus speaking. And who says shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. Did you catch it? Jesus says when you swear by the temple, you're swearing by the one who lives in the temple. There's someone who lives in this temple. Who is the one who lives in the temple? First Chronicles 29 verse 1. David talks about Solomon building a house not for man but for God. First Chronicles 29 verse 1. Watch here. <laughs> First Chronicles 29, verse 1. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon my son, whom alone God hath chosen, as yet young and tender, and the work is great, for the palace is not for man, but for the Lord, for Jehovah. Did you catch it? This palace, this temple in Jerusalem, is not built for man. It's built for Jehovah God. God lives in the temple. How can Jesus then say he's greater than the temple? Because notice what he said. If you swear by the temple, you're swearing by it and the one who lives in it. So to say that you're greater than the temple either means you're claiming to be greater than the one who lives in it or you're claiming to be the one who lives in it. If Jesus is just a man, how can he dare say he's greater than the temple when that means he's claiming to be greater than the God who lives in it? So what is Jesus claiming to be when he says he's greater than the temple? 
Not that he's greater than God who lives in it, but he's claiming to be the God who owns it. The temple is mine. I own it, which is why I'm greater than the temple, because I'm the God of the temple. You caught, you caught that? But then he says he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He owns the Sabbath. It belongs to him. So he, he determines what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath. But hold on, folks. Leviticus 23, verse 3. See what it says. Leviticus 23, verse 3. See what he says. It is. It is blasphemy if he's not God. But the Sabbath belongs to who? Leviticus 23, verse 3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. It is the Sabbath of Jehovah. Shabbat of Jehovah. The Sabbath belongs to Jehovah. So he orders you what you can and cannot do. But hold on, hold on, Jesus. The Sabbath belongs to Jehovah. He owns it. You just said, you the son of man. You're the Lord of the Sabbath. You own it. It belongs to you. And you claim to be greater than the temple, even though the temple is not built for man. It, it's built for God and God lives in it. Who do you think you are? Who are you claiming to be by saying that you're greater than the temple and the very Lord of the Sabbath? And notice, he as the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Who does he think he is? Wow. Corinth Chandler, my entire focus is to affirm and defend the core doctrines of the Christian faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why I spend more time on the Bible, because even if I destroy Islam, that doesn't make someone a Christian. But when I explain and answer and defend the core doctrines of the Christian faith, not only do Muslims get convicted, but Christians become strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit and fall more in love with their God, fall more in love with Jesus, right? Clear, isn't it? Now let's go for the final one today. The parable, which is found in Matthew 21, Mark 12, <clears throat> as well as Luke 20. This parable is found in all three Gospels. Matthew 21, Mark 12, Luke 20. So we're going to focus on the Mark conversion. Actually, J17, cross-reference Revelation 2.23 of Jeremiah 17.10. In fact, since you brought it up, let me show you a better cross-reference. Are you ready? Okay, let, let's, let me, let's, let's go to Jeremiah 17, verse 10. Yes, Solomon, don't believe it, know it. Don't say I believe. He's claiming to be the God of the Sabbath, Jehovah of the Sabbath, and the God of the temple. Okay. J17, let's look at Jeremiah 17, 10. Let's do this real quick. I, Jehovah the Lord, search the heart, try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So guys, pay attention to Jeremiah 17, 10. Jehovah says, I'm the one who searches the hearts, and I will test your innermost being, your thoughts. Why? So that I, Jehovah, give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So did you catch it? Did you catch it? Jehovah says, I'm the one who searches the hearts of everyone and tests your innermost being, your inner man, your inner person. See what's hidden in your soul to then repay you, reward you for what you've earned. Jehovah said that, right? You, ca you caught it? You catch that? Jehovah's the one who searches the hearts of everyone and then tests their innermost being to reward them. Now, this means that Jehovah must be omniscient and omnipotent. He must know what every heart desires, and he must know the thought of every person, every second, every moment of their existence, in order to be able to perfectly repay them for what they have earned. And he must have infinite riches and resources to be able to repay everyone according to their earnings, right? So that proves that Jehovah is omniscient and omnipotent, right? Is that clear? 
Those of you who are watching me for the first time, subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit that like button because I want to make my channel go viral for the glory of Christ. Clear, right? Okay. Now let's put Revelation 2, verse 18, and then 23. Here, let me help you out, Orbit. Guys, here's the order. I'm going to put, type it so you follow with me. Revelation 2, chapter 2, verse 18, and verse 23 with Jeremiah 17 10 so we can read all three of them back to back Right all three of them back to back okay. All three of them back to back we already got two dislikes by people gee I'm shocked And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. Catch who's speaking. Please, let me know you're getting it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Please, Lord Jesus, bless your people. Notice who's speaking. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. The Son of God is speaking. Who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. In 23, notice what the Son of God says in 23. Notice the Son of God is speaking. And I, the Son of God speaking, will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he. Verse 18, it's the Son of God speaking. You can't escape this. So I got to start with 18. I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Jesus said, I am he, the Son of God, who searches the reins and hearts, and I, the Son of God, will give unto every one of, of you according to your works. Hold on. Let's read Jeremiah 17, 10 again. I, the Lord, I, Jehovah, search the heart, try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. What? In Revelation 2, 18 to 23, Jesus, the Son of God, is speaking. It said, the Son of God speaks. It's not the Father. He, the Son of God, says, I am the one who searches the reins and the hearts. I'm the one who will give to every one of you according to your works. But Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, Jehovah, try the reins. I, Jehovah, search the hearts. I, Jehovah, give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Why in the world is Jesus the Son of God, again, quoting the words of Jehovah and applying it to himself? Why is Jesus the Son of God claiming to do what Jehovah does and claiming to be able to know what only Jehovah knows? Can you explain that to me? So you're telling me Jesus in, in Revelation 2, the Son of God, is claiming to be Jehovah of Jeremiah, the God of Jeremiah, Jehovah of the Old Testament? Man. With that said, are you ready for the final passage for today? God, ready. ready for it? Hallelujah. All power is given to the Son. Yep, he is all-knowing. He's all-powerful, present everywhere, because he is God in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit. Okay, final one, Mark 12, verses 1 to 10. Even though it goes all the way to 12, we'll read it to 10. Mark 12, verses 1. You know what? Mark 12, verses 1 to 9. Mark 12, verses 1 to 9. It goes to the 12, but we're going to read Mark 12, verses 1 to 9. Mark 12, verses 1 to 9. Now read this with me, folks, and I'm going to unpack it. Using the parables to show how Jesus claims to be God in the flesh, distinct from the Father in person, yet one with the Father in essence, the divine Son of God. Mark 12, verses 1 and 9. Okay, let's read. And he began to speak unto them by parables, Jesus speaking. A certain man planted a vineyard and set a, set a hedge about it, and digged the place for the wine fat, and built the tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. So a man <clears throat> planted a vineyard, built a wall around it, and hired tenants, vineyards, people to, to tend to it and watch over it. Husbandman means tenants, people to manage it and watch over it. 
Now notice verse 2, folks. And at the season, he, he sent to the husbandmen, the tenants, a servant, pay attention, a servant, that he might receive from the husband of the fruit of the vineyard, his portion, his share. And they caught him and beat him. So they beat the servant and sent him away empty. And again, he sent unto them another servant. And at him, they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. <clears throat> and again, he sent unto them another servant. And at him, they cast stones, okay? Wounded in the head, sent him away shamefully handled, right? Okay, now watch five. And again, he sent another and him they killed and many others beating some and killing some. Now watch here, Mark 12, six to eight is the key, but watch here, watch here. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them saying, they will reverence my son. So notice now, he is going to send one final person. This is their last chance of doing right. This is it, this is your last chance, your last hope, one final person. But the one he sends finally is not a servant. It's his beloved son, the son of his love, the son of his heart, the son that he adores. Let me read six again. Having yet therefore one son, only one son, he's unique, his well-beloved, the one he loves and adores, he sent him also last, this is their last chance, that's it, saying they will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, this is the heir. So this son of his, whom he loves and adores, is the heir. He owns everything that the owner possesses. He's the heir of the owner. Whatever the owner possesses, he owns it. Don't forget that point. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandmen and will give the vineyard unto others. Now let's break down the implication of this. We're not going to look at this passage, but I want you to read it on your own leisure. Isaiah 5, verses 1 to 7. Don't quote it. Isaiah 5, 1 to 7 tells us that the vineyard is Israel. There it tells us what the vineyard is, is Israel and the inhabitants of Israel. So number one, the vineyard is the land of Israel and its inhabitants. The husbandmen, the tenants, are the religious authorities. The religious authorities, the rulers, the religious establishment. Who are the servants? Let's go to Jeremiah 7, verse 25. Let's see. I'm going to write down the verses, but we're not going to look at all of them. Jeremiah 7, verse 25. 26, verse 5. 29, 19. And 44, verse 4. We're just going to look at Jeremiah 7, 25. But you guys can write down the references. Right? Jeremiah 7, 25. M's, Ms. SVPI, that's who Jesus is. He's the very heart of the Father. The very heart of the Father. The Son of His heart. The Son of His love. Who the Father loves and adores with the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah 7, 25. That's who Jesus Christ our Lord is. Jeremiah 7, 25. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt, unto this day I have even sent unto you all my servants the prophets. You see who the servants are, folks? Daily rising up early and sending them. Did you catch it? The servants are the prophets. Catch it. Jeremiah 7, 25. Revelation 11, 18. Revelation 11, 18. The servants are the prophets. Revelation 11, 18. We're almost done. Revelation 11, verse 18. Exactly J17. Is Revelation 11, 18? Watch what happens here. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Did you catch it? Who are the servants? The prophets of God. So let's break down the parable. The owner is God. The vineyard is Israel and its inhabitants. The tenants, the husbandmen, are the religious authorities, the rulers. The servants are the prophets. But guess who Jesus claimed to be? Let's look at Mark 12, 6 to 7 again. Notice who Jesus claimed to be. Mark 12, 6 to 7. 
Let's catch who Jesus just claimed to be because Jesus is telling this parable. He's the one telling this parable and he's identifying himself. Right? Mark 12, 6 to 7. Watch here. One more time. Who is Jesus? Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir. Did you catch who Jesus claimed to be? He is not a servant, but he is the beloved son of the owner and the heir. So you see where Jesus just placed himself? The servants are the prophets. I'm not among them. I'm greater than them, higher than them, better than them. Unlike the prophets who are servants, I am the son of God, the son of his heart, his beloved son, whom he loves and adores, and I am the heir of God. You know what he just claimed to be? The son who owns everything that belongs to God. Now, let me break that down. Since the servants are the prophets and they belong to God, and Jesus is the son who is the heir, that means Jesus just claimed to be the owner of the prophets, the Lord of the prophets. The prophets belong to him because if they're servants of God the Father and Jesus is the son of the Father who's the heir, who owns everything that God owns, that means he owns the prophets. The pro prophets belong to him, are subject to him. <clears throat> they are his servants. He is their Lord. Hold on, but God also owns Israel and the inhabitants of Israel. But Jesus is the son of his heart, his beloved son, who is the heir of the father. So if God owns Israel and its inhabitants, and Jesus is the heir. That means Jesus also owns Israel and all who live in Israel. It all belongs to him. But wait, God doesn't just own Israel. He owns all creation. He owns all creation. So if Jesus is the heir to God, and he owns whatever God owns and possesses whatever God possesses, if God possesses the entire creation and Jesus is the heir to God, that means Jesus owns all creation and everything in it. So he's greater than creation, distinct from creation, and one with the Father in glory, power, and essence. That's who Jesus just claimed to be in that parable. That's who Jesus just claimed to be in that parable. Did you catch it? You see how much meat there is in the parables of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? He says things in those parables that show that Christ believed and affirmed and proved by his miracles at resurrection that he's more than a man. He's God in the flesh, the divine, unique son of God, the very heart of the father, who's one with the father in essence, nature and glory, but distinct from him in person. That's who Jesus claims to be in these parables. Okay, folks, with that said, this session is over. Would you like me to come back, God willing, if God wills, and the internet connection is good, tomorrow around 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time? 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Would you like me to do another session? Glory to Jesus forever and ever indeed. Let me know if you guys want to join me. It will be 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, tomorrow, God willing. Okay, well, then that means... Pray for tomorrow's session and invite people to come. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Hit the like button and prayerfully consider supporting the ministry. So here's my prayer requests. Again, I want to thank all of you guys already supporting me, keeping me in ministry. God bless you for serving me by supporting me financially and prayerfully because we're in ministry for the glory of Christ. But pray for more supporters so I can be fully funded for the glory of Christ. <clears throat> Thank you for supporting me. You Patreon supporters and those of you who give via PayPal, God bless you. I am indebted to you, and I thank the Lord Jesus for moving your hearts to contribute. Keep praying for me, and if you guys believe that I'm called to full-time ministry, then can you pray that God will confirm it by helping me to be holy for the Lord, to love the Lord, to obey the Lord, and live for him, not just be lip service, and pray for my two angels, my daughters. Pray for them, that God will bless them and sustain them and provide for them, and, and fight this battle for us, keeping us together. And do pray, Lord willing, that God will confirm my move eventually to Arizona because I plan on leaving at the end of summer and relocating and starting a new life with my daughters in Arizona in Jesus' name. Pray for that, please. Pray for that as well. 
and pray, like I said, that God will continue to open doors of ministry so I can teach more, write more, travel more for the glory of Christ, <clears throat> and also pray that the Lord will show me, because again, guys, it's hard to be alone, and unless you have the gift of celibacy, right, which I don't, that it is good to find a godly companion. Pray God will confirm his will, because there may be one on the horizon, someone that I have my eyes on, pray that the Lord will show me if she's the one and confirm it, not just to me, but to her. Someone that I really think is an amazing person. Really, she's truly amazing. Amazing, and you sense just the presence of the Lord. So pray for that, if you don't mind. God's will be done, right? If it's not, make it known to me. If it is, confirm to her and bring us together for his glory to magnify Christ together. So thank you, guys, right? I love you guys for the sake of Christ. Forgive me if I was unnecessarily offensive. Help me to help you. Work with me, not against me. And Lord Jesus willing, I'll see you tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Solomon. Do pray that God will confirm whether she's the one and confirm it to her as well. Love you guys. Christ is risen. And pray also, God help me to continue losing weight to get my health back. And definitely make me handsome in her sight with the beauty of Jesus. Amen. Baruch Hashem Yeshua. Take care. Love you guys. Switch it down. Oops. Hold on. Shutting down. How do I shut down? All right.